Hey church, it is Easter and I am out of outdoor places that sound biblical-ish to shoot sermons. It's kind of hard when you're not supposed to be traveling around a whole lot. So I thought what I would do is um, use my table. That seems pretty biblical too. You may be asking why haven't we been using the table the entire time, less wind noise, all of that kind of stuff. I'm just going to warn you there's possibility that you're going to see some Sparks kid running around in their under ruse. I don't think it's going to happen. I've kind of put them all in the back of the house, but you never know. And so today's Easter, and um, I want to begin this morning with just a scripture reading, uh, one that I love, one that seems to carry a lot of weight in times like this from 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 9 and go on down through the end of the chapter. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, since you are immigrants and strangers in the world, I urge that you avoid worldly desires that wage war against your lives. Live honorably among unbelievers. Today they defame you as if you were doing evil, but in the day when God visits to judge, they will glorify him because they have observed your honorable deeds. For the sake of the Lord, submit to every human institution. Do this whether, whether it means submitting to the emperor as supreme ruler or to governors as those sent by the emperor. They are sent to punish those doing evil and to praise those doing good. Submit to them because it is God's will that, that by doing good you will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Do this as God's slaves, and yet also as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Have respectful fear of God. Honor the emperor. Household slaves, submit by accepting the authority of your masters with all respect. Do this not only to the good and kind masters, but also to those who are harsh. Now, it is commendable if, because of one's understanding of God, someone should endure pain through suffering unjustly. But what praise comes from enduring patiently when you have sinned and are beaten for it? But if you endure steadfastly when you've done good and suffer for it, this is commendable before God. You were called to this kind of endurance because Christ suffered on your behalf. He left you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, nor did he ever speak in ways meant to deceive. When he was insulted, he did not reply with insults. When he suffered, he did not threaten revenge. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He carried in his own body on the cross the sins we committed he did this so that we might live in righteousness, having nothing to do with sin. By his wounds you were healed, though you were like straying sheep. You have now returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your lives. If these last few weeks have highlighted anything, it's uh, highlighted that one of the things that we are principally afraid of in our society is vulnerability. We simply don't like being vulnerable. Um, we are a society, a culture that is accustomed to things like comfort and security. We are accustomed to not having to think about the sorts of things on a day-in, day-out basis that most of the people in the rest of the world experience. Um, it has been noted for some time now that every time uh, there is a shooting or a terrorist attack or something like that that affects American citizens and we all rightfully stand up uh, that and wonder you know what's going on with this this is horrible this is awful uh, for a long time has been noted that that's actually the sort of thing that most people in the world have to deal with on a regular basis we're just not accustomed to that level of vulnerability uh, starting a few weeks back when things like toilet paper 
started uh, getting scarce. We thought it was going to become the new currency. I'll trade you a boat for a roll of Charmin and uh, a bottle of hand sanitizer. Don't give me any small offers. I want a yacht, right? Um, when toilet paper started becoming scarce, and then for a while there, things like bottled water and meat and dried beans and a lot of the things that we've been looking for lately have become hard to find. We're not accustomed to that. And that scared us a little bit. Uh, that made us feel a little bit vulnerable in ways that most of the rest of the world experiences on a much more regular basis. We are not accustomed to those sorts of things. I know for me when it really kind of settled down into reality was when Walmart announced that they were going to start closing at 8.30 every night. Now, I can't tell you the last time I wanted to go or actually went to Walmart after 8.30 at night. It's not the sort of thing I want to do. It's not the sort of thing I normally do. I have no need to go to Walmart after 8.30. But I'm so accustomed to just being able to get up and go to the store anytime I want to go that for that option to be taken away from me, that um, brought home some realities that I don't often have to consider. And so I think that one of the things, as accustomed to comfort, if there's any pain that we it's, uh, experience, we can, we can take a pill. If there's any sort of unpleasantness that we experience, we can change the channel. Um, as a custom as we are to comfort and security, one of the things that we are dealing with in this Easter season is the inevitability of vulnerability. And we don't like being vulnerable. And so the virus that is plaguing us now and all of the dangers that it faces reminds us in ways that's hard to escape that our lives are more vulnerable than we think they are. Our way of life is not as robust as we think it is. And something like this, something you can't even see, something you don't even know that you have until it's well past too late, can disrupt everything about our lives, if not take our lives. And, and so we're scared. We express that anxiety. We express that fear in a variety of different ways. Um, some of us obsess. Some of us joke. Some of us get angry. Some of us binge watch Netflix or, or play video games. Some of us are going stir crazy as we are uh, bored at home. But we're accustomed to being able to push away that vulnerability. And all of a sudden now we can't do it. And so what does that have to do with Easter? And precisely what that has to do with Easter is this. Um, in our society, vulnerability is one of the things that we simply don't like. We like to assume that we are in control, that things are going the way we want to, that we can fix all of the problems, that if something arises through our own ingenuity and our own intelligence and our own hard work, that we can overcome those things and soon everything will return to normal. But now in times like this, we have to wrestle with the fact that things don't sometimes quickly return to normal. And now we are even at a point where we're trying to wonder what normal even looks like. We don't like that. Vulnerability is a bad thing in our society. We want to be comfortable, we want to be secure, but you understand that vulnerability is for those who are people of the cross, not a vice, but a virtue. As a matter of fact, when you begin to look at the way of Jesus and you remember that Jesus didn't die on the cross for us by itself, but he also calls us to take up our crosses and follow, uh, vulnerability is one of those essential things to being a Christian. We can't love the way that Jesus loves without being vulnerable. Because the very act of love is putting someone else first. The very act of love is saying, I am going to open myself to your needs and to your desires and to what's best for you. And sometimes that's all fine and dandy. Sometimes your needs and your desires and what's best for you, that uh, coincides with my needs, my desires, what's best for me. It's all 
good and proper when Michelle and I try to go out to eat and uh, we both want Mexican. But sometimes love opens us to vulnerability. As a matter of fact, without the possibility of vulnerability, you can't have real love. And so what love is, in the biblical sense, is redrawing that border that we build around ourselves to keep us safe and comfortable to include others. And the question that that lawyer asked Jesus, um, who is my neighbor that I'm supposed to love, is really a most dangerous question because Jesus answers that question by telling a story about two people who hate one another. And he says, those people that you hate those people who are nothing like you, those people who you can't stand to be around, those people who are the last people in the world you want to see coming in a time of need or vulnerability. Those people are your neighbors. Go love those people. And so we redraw, following Jesus, that line, that boundary that we draw around ourselves to protect ourselves. We redraw it around even those that we hate even those that hate us, even those that would do us harm. As a matter of fact, Jesus would say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, uh, or at the end of Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, rather, he would say, you haven't done anything if you just love the people who are like you. You haven't done anything if you just love your family. Uh, everybody can love the people they like. But we are followers of God who loves everyone. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He causes the sun to rise on the righteous and the unrighteous. And that is a scary and a vulnerable proposition. We see this, of course, uh, most clearly in the life of Jesus. Jesus came in committed to this ethic of love, this way of love that he called the kingdom of God. It was in the upper room that he said, I'm getting ready to give you a, a new way as I am glorified, crowned king over the way things should be. And this new way, he says, is that you will love one another as I have loved you. This way of love is the way that Jesus embodied in his life. This way of love is the way that Jesus called us to embody in our lives. And you understand on this weekend of all weekends that when Jesus embodied that sort of love in a world that is bent on protecting its own, that is controlled by fear and death and power, that when you make yourself vulnerable like that, when Jesus made himself vulnerable like that, what it got him was the cross. That the vulnerability is real. That sometimes bad things do happen. And one of the things you'll notice about the Bible is, uh, the Bible will say often, do, do not be afraid. It will give you a variety of reasons for not being afraid. But it never says that there aren't things to be afraid of in the world. There are always scary things in the world, and it doesn't minimize that. But it says that God is bigger than those. And so we've been called to take up our crosses, to follow after Jesus, to, as the language of 1 Peter 2 says, to follow in the example of Jesus. This is our calling. This is our vocation to be like Jesus. In what sense, we ask Peter, he says, Jesus was the one who, leaving an example for us, went to the cross. He laid down his considerable power. He made himself vulnerable. He drew that boundary wider and wider and wider to include not only the people who would follow him, not only the people who liked him, not only the people who cheered Hosanna, Hosanna on the Sunday before his death, but also the ones who would yell, crucify him, crucify him. And we have no king but Caesar. And also the ones who would drive the nails into his hands and his feet. Vulnerability is a virtue in Christianity. We cannot love. We cannot take up our crosses without being vulnerable. But surely that's something that Jesus could do, but he doesn't expect us to do that, right? I mean, how can Jesus do this? 
How does that work? Don't you know that things are big and bad and horrible and scary in the world? Don't you know that death is real and it's awful final? And so much of what we do is to push away the vulnerability of death. But that's where I want you to focus in on this um, one little line from the end of this text we read in 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says uh, to a group of people accustomed, accustomed to fighting with, coming face to face with their own smallness amidst the large brokenness of the world. They were accustomed to vulnerability. They were accustomed to knowing that they really didn't have much of a secure place in the world. And now Peter calls them into this ethic of love that looks like the cross. And, and this is how he says it happens. He says that we've been called to endure like Christ has endured, that he left an example for us, that this is our calling, that when he was insulted, he did not repay with insults, that when he was uh, threatened, he did not threaten revenge in return. And then it says, in going to the cross, in laying down his power, in taking up the way of love rather than the way of fear and anxiety, and I got to get some power over that thing that I'm afraid of, that I'm anxious about, it, it says that in taking up his cross, this is what he did. It says that he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. I love that phrase uh, when I was studying it years ago in Greek class. It, it evokes images of all state commercials, actually. He places himself in the hands of the one who's going to do what is right. And so in a scary world where we're awful small, where we're awful vulnerable, where all sorts of things could go wrong, where all sorts of people are out to uh, harm us or at least take up their self-interest before ours in a variety of ways. In a world where everything is dark and broken, Jesus calls us to be the people of love who lays down our power who takes up vulnerability, who opens ourselves to the possibility of suffering and hurt and death. And we look at him and we say, how, how can we do that? And Peter says that Jesus did that by trusting the one who would do what is right. That in going to the cross, Jesus trusted the one who would do what is right. And so Jesus places his life in the hands of God. He refused to take up the sword that Satan offered him. He refused to manipulate the system as Rome did. He refused to play the games of the world controlled by fear and death. And rather than taking up that considerable power, I mean, don't you know all he had to do is snap his fingers and the whole thing would be over? Rather than taking up that considerable power, he lays his power down. He stretches out his arms on the cross in love and he trusts God to do what is right. And let me tell you, on Friday, it looked like God had let him down. Even Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The sun sets on Friday all through Saturday. The sun goes down on Saturday. It looks like Satan had won. All of the brokenness and darkness and violence and pain and despair and hurt and wrong and corruption of the world came to bear on Jesus on the cross. And it looked for all the world like Satan had killed God in the flesh. But when Jesus went to the grave, Peter reminds us what Jesus discovered was that there in the midst of the grave, there in the midst of the darkest darkness that the world can throw at someone, there in the lowest pit that the world can toss us into, there at the worst possible moment that we can conjure, when Jesus laid his life down and found himself in that spot, Peter says he found God there. 
and God was bigger than death. And God did what was right. And so we are in the world as those who can lay down our fears and lay down our anxieties because we know that in the darkest of storms, in the bleakest of moments, in the most hopeless of spots, God is there and that he is bigger than anything the world can throw at us. On Friday, it looked like Satan had won. It looked like God was not trustworthy. It looked like all of the vulnerability that Jesus showed in laying down his power and redrawing his circle was wasted. But then Sunday came. And we're called to be a people shaped like the cross because we know that Sunday is a reality. Let's pray. Father, there are all sorts of scary things in our world. There are all sorts of things that make us anxious, and these things are real, and they have teeth, and they hurt. And we are so tempted to retreat inside of our little bubbles, to hide from the world, to circle the wagons, to use what little light we have to protect ourselves from the darkness. But Father, we know that you are the one who is bigger than the darkness. And you are the one who revealed yourself in the resurrection of Jesus as bigger than the grave. And so, Father, may we lay our power down. May we redraw our boundaries. May we be the people in these trying times who can sit with the vulnerability love requires long enough to be your light in the world. Now we pray as your family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let's remember who we are as we go into God's world. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second one like it is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, or you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commands depend all of the law and the prophets. We love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can be seen, can't love God who can't be seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. In church, as we go, let me just leave you with a benediction from the end of Jude. To the one who is able to protect you from falling and to present you blameless and rejoicing before his glorious presence. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, belong glory and majesty and power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you. We miss you. We can't wait to see you again. Keep being the presence of God in this darkness. We'll see you next time.